Uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, this is the automated firewall testing talk. Um, before we get started, uh, let's uh, talk about something nobody cares about who I am. Uh, so I'm Christoph, KP at FreeBSD.org. I sort of maintain PF in FreeBSD. So if it doesn't work in FreeBSD, it's all the fault of the OpenBSD people. <laughs> but if it does work, it's thanks to my glorious efforts. <laughs> or possibly the other way around. Uh, professionally, I do a lot of uh, embedded Linux projects. Uh, I will happily do FreeBSD or other BSD projects. I got suckered into being on the EuroBSD Colm Foundation board, uh, which means, well, that is the reason I've been chasing <coughs> everyone to submit to the call for papers for EuroBSD Colm. I will repeat that. Submit to submit your papers and tutorials to EuroBSD Colm. You have until the 26th. No, seriously, do this, otherwise it's going to be about 20 slots of me repeating this talk. <laughs> Uh, I also always feel the need to point out that you know I'm not for sale, but I can be rented at reasonable rates. That's where you're failing. <laughs> be rented at unreasonable rates. Well, I didn't say reasonable to whom. Anyway, what is PF? Um, PF is a packet filter. We uh, we stole it from OpenBSD. Yeah, imported it from OpenBSD as a word. Uh, last import was a while ago, so what we have is, a, is an older version. Uh, it's not exactly what's in OpenBSD at the moment. Uh, but we also have a couple of shiny things in FreeBSD that are not in OpenBSD, uh, one of which is VNet, and a lot more about VNet later. Another one is that our PF sort of runs multi-core, uh, which means that it's, it's faster. <coughs> Note the ER, I didn't say fast, I said faster. They're different concepts. I keep recommending that people use IPFW, but I saw the survey results from the FreeBSD users and they don't listen to me. Uh, so, you know, uh, thank you OpenBSD. It turns out our users really like your firewall. Uh, On to, you know, relevant things for this talk. Uh, why automated testing? Uh, I think the obvious answer is because we're all lazy and testing is, you know, boring, repetitive, mind-numbing work, and somebody someday should invent a machine that's good at boring and repetitive and mind-numbing work. Oh, wait! Um, slightly more seriously, why do we want automated tests? You know, to make sure that things work. It turns out that our users like it when they install something and it works. They don't get excited when it explodes in new and unexpected ways. Yeah, users are strange, but what are you going to do? Uh, it's also really nice to have a convenient test case. So, you know, does this thing actually work? I'm going to try to roll out something on my network. Let's, you know, test to make sure that it works. Also about preventing regressions. It works today. It would be nice if it still works tomorrow. And it turns out that with complicated software, it's really, really easy to accidentally make a mistake that breaks it. And there are a lot of ways things can go wrong, and you're not always going to notice immediately when it does go wrong. Um, actually have uh, some examples here. Um, yeah, that might be related to you know the end of my bio about not talking to me about IPv6 fragmentation. Um, Fragment handling is broken several times. So one of the things I, I uh, liberated from OpenBSD was to teach uh, PF to deal with IPv6 fragments. So that you know we, we gather up all of the fragments, we reassemble, we filter on the reassembled packet, and then we send out. And when we send out, we have to refragment because IPv6 and path MTU discovery and all of those things. I'm not going to go into that. The main point is that it, it's been broken several times. The first time it broke on December 12th of 2016. And we noticed October 25th of 2017, or rather we fixed it October 25th of 2017. That is a you know, pretty long time for it to be broken. Uh, the problem in, in the first case was that we checked the packet size before the PFIL hook, so before we went into uh, PF. 
So PF didn't have the chance to refragment before it got transmitted. So the, the stack looked at it and went, yes, but this packet is way too big. Let me send an ICMP uh, packet to big error back to a host who has no idea what you're talking about because he sent much smaller packets. The second one is a better example. Uh, well, I say better, you know, would, would have been better if we didn't break it, but it's software, we're going to be breaking things. Uh, it was broken as a result of a security fix. Uh, if that number doesn't mean anything to you, uh, basically the problem was that uh, the way we handled packet fragments could be exploited uh, to trigger worst case performance, uh, which would make things very, very slow and your machine would not be doing anything else other than you know, sitting there trying to reassemble packets that were designed to be very difficult to reassemble. That got fixed, except it accidentally broke v6 reassembly. Oops. Uh, but, you know, Bjorn, nobody cares about IPv6, right? He's in the back, that's why I, I'm brave enough to say this. <laughs> uh, it broke, and the tests noticed this immediately. Uh, only it was a PF test, so everybody just went, yeah, it's Christoph's fault, we don't need to look at this. Uh, I looked at it, managed to find a fix for it, uh, and it only took two weeks. Now, two weeks is longer than we would like it to be broken, but given a choice between being broken for two weeks and being broken for nine months, uh, I think it's a fairly obvious choice. Uh, for additional fun, uh, that bug was, was one of these very strange bugs. Uh, when I started detracing things, it went away. Uh, I'll... Uh, I've actually got the code here, and uh, I'll give you a few seconds to uh, try to work out what the problem was. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, well, whatever. I have Jeopardy music, and I can't figure out how to make it play, so just imagine the Jeopardy jingle, and I'll give you a few more seconds to. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> so we've, we've all spotted the bug, right? So I don't need to be embarrassed that it took me an embarrassingly long time to figure it out. Uh, I can show you the patch. Does that help? Well, going, going back to the code, basically, you know, we, uh, we hash uh, the fragments into buckets now to, to speed up the lookup. And so we allocate a hash key, which you know needs to be the size of two IPv6 addresses and another 32 bits for a fragment ID, except that the you know, size of uh, I6 adder is 128 bits, so uh, mumble number of bytes, times four, because you in 32T. And then we hash over the entire size of the array. So we grab some random stack garbage, include that in the hash, and then stick it in a bucket. And if your random stack garbage is different on every entry into the function, you're going to hash your fragments into different buckets, and you're never ever going to reassemble them. Unless, of course, you detrace frag6 input, and then your stack garbage is, you know, so whatever's left behind by detrace, so it's predictable. So it all hashes back into the same buckets, and it works. Uh, I will, you know, I will not point to guilty people, mostly because I don't actually remember whose fault it was. Uh, I just remember being uh, annoyed at, having, at uh, figuring this one out. Uh, so you know, we, we fixed it, and, and that was awesome. I hope I've convinced you of, you know, tests are a good idea. Uh, what do we want out of these tests? Uh, I want them to be easy to write uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first and most important one being, you know, I'm lazy and I want things to be easy. Uh, but another one is that I would like more people to write tests. Uh, I'll get back to this, but when I get bug reports from users uh, about PF issues, the vast majority of the time I spend on trying to fix them is not looking at the code, debugging it, it's not writing a patch, it's, what the hell are you doing? What's your setup? And then, you know, given your setup, what goes on to make it break? 
So if you want me to fix a bug for you, well, not the best way. The second best way is to give me the test case. Because I have to write the test anyway. Uh, the very best way to get me to fix a bug for you, of course, is to pay me. Uh, so anyway, we want them to be easy to write, we want them to be easy for everyone to run them, uh, which means that hopefully people will run those tests before they commit something, <laughs> and will notice that, they've, that they broke something before they commit it. <coughs> that has a number of advantages, you know, they, they look smarter because they didn't, break, they didn't commit something that broke stuff. Uh, we don't break things for our users, and we have some extremely brave users who run, uh, you know, large chunks of the internet, or at least large chunks of video across the internet who like using latest and greatest. It would be nice if we didn't break things for them. Uh, but it also means, you know, from a strictly selfish point of view, that you're going to notice that you broke something rather than, you know, committing something and then me getting shouted at for the PF tests breaking again. You know, I might be very selfish. Uh, we also want them to be fast to run. That sort of fits in with, you know, wanting everyone to run them. Because if it only takes two minutes to run, they'll run them. If it takes four hours to run, they won't. We also want them to integrate with the automated testing framework, which is an um, automated testing framework in QA. The uh, automated tests for PF are built around that. They are wonderful tools that we came up with ourselves and totally didn't steal from NetBSD. Um, because if they integrate with that, they will turn up in our uh, Jenkins instance. Uh, this is a very old screenshot. We've got more tests now, but this one had 7,300 tests. And in this case, well, two failures. Uh, that's two more than we'd like, but at least uh, most of the system <laughs> works. These get run often. Uh, when you know, happen to know off the top of your head how often they get run, that's every couple of hours at the worst, right? Yeah. yeah. So every couple of hours, uh, so ideally when you commit something and it breaks, uh, there will be evidence of this a couple of hours later, and with any luck you'll actually look at this and, and notice that, oh wait, I committed something and everything's broken now. Um, Lee Wen very kindly writes uh, weekly reports about the state of our tests and sends them to FreeBSD testing at and a couple of other mailing lists. Uh, so there's someone actually following up on this. Uh, so how do we build these tests? The, uh, you know, the, the obvious way to do this is we, we get a bunch of hardware and yeah, get a we get a server, we get a switch, we get another server, we send packets from server A to server B, and maybe we get some replies and we look at them. And that's great, unless we want to forward. Okay, server, switch, server, switch, server, and we send packets through that. Unless, of course, we want to do PF sync or CARP or more complicated setups, so you know, even more hardware. And that's got advantages. You can do things like performance testing when you have real hardware. Uh, but it's got a couple of downsides as well, like, you know, this is a firewall test. One of the tests we'd like to do is block all traffic. Kind of hard to remotely configure a system if you block all traffic. You can go and, you know, uh, configure it over serial lines, but then you need more hardware and more machines to talk to, and all of those things. We want to run the same FreeBSD version on all of these systems, so okay, we'll netboot them, but yeah, firewall pretty annoying that, you know, you, you netboot, you mount your root file system over NFS, and then you block all traffic and your root file system goes away. There are ways around this, but it, you know, it becomes complicated. Then what happens if the machine panics? You need to have control code that will, you know, manage or will understand that, hey, this machine panicked, I should collect the information out of it, and I should give it a hard reset. Oh, by the way, we need some more hardware to do this. You can imagine complicated setups. You know, where does all of this hardware live? I have too much old hardware at home, but not enough hardware to build all of this, so it would have to live somewhere else. But if we need five machines and serial interfaces and, all, and power switches, we can't really expect all developers to have this setup. 
So how do other people write tests for this when they can't <coughs> test their tests? There are advantages to this setup. Uh, Alexander did a, um, did a great talk about it. Uh, one of the advantages is you can do meaningful performance testing against it. But I'm sure he'll agree that it's, it's a complicated setup that needs some care and feeding. Uh, so, so, you know, that's a downside. Uh, the obvious way around all of these is, you know, virtual hardware. We've got Beehive. Beehive is great. We can run any number of machines, well, you know, low number of machines, but enough to build our setups in Beehive. And that's ac actually the approach taken by a student in uh, Google Summer of Code 2017 to try to build this. We've still got some issues, you know, we block all traffic and, oops, we've got a serial port or we can pretend to have a serial port and we can make that work. Great. But our automated tests on ci.3bsd.org run in Beehive. So we'd have to run Beehive inside Beehive. And I don't actually know if that's possible, but if it is, it's bound to be slow. <laughs> if Docker Docker is good enough for everyone in the cloud, Beehive Beehive should be good enough. Yeah. Uh, another issue with that, and that's where the what the uh, Google Summer of Code student ran into is that it is really, really annoying to build VM in images during your build run. It takes forever, and you need a lot of storage and and all of those things. You've still got issues coping with panics. It's still possible, but it's still annoying. It's also really slow because you're waiting for emulated, well, uh, virtualized machines to boot. Um, you know best case 20-30 seconds, depending on what hardware you've got. It's an improvement, but it's still annoying. Uh, I you know, keep telling you what solutions won't work, uh, what will work. Well, VNet, or Network Stack Virtualization. Uh, hands up everyone who knows and loves VNet. Okay, for those of you who don't know, it's Network Stack Virtualization. There we go, I've explained it. Uh, it's associated with a jail, and it basically turns a jail into a pretend virtual machine. <coughs> they all run the same kernel, but every jail can have its own network uh, interfaces. It can have its own uh, IP addresses set. You can set IP, whatever IP address you like. You can also run your firewall inside the jail. For all intents and purposes, you have your own machine. Of course, it's not 100% the same as running on actual hardware, but it's 99% the same code. PF supports this. Uh, actually, to, to be entirely fair, all of our firewalls support this now. I'm mostly focused on PF because I spent some time arguing with PF uh, about, you know, maybe you should try not panicking when we run you in a jail. Uh, after a while, that sank in, and now it, it usually doesn't panic when you run it in a jail. <laughs> the usual disclaimer there, right? Uh, I do development. I, I, look at, uh, I look at bugs that users report, so I spend all of my time looking at bugs. And once I've fixed one of them, it goes away, but I go on and look at the next bug. So there tends to be a perception of everything is broken and everything is horrible. Turns out that as a user, and I actually use uh, PF in VNet jails myself on my uh, on one of my machines, and, and it works just fine. Uh, it, I don't actually think that machine's ever panicked over one of those things. So it, it you know it works a lot better than I get the impression. But uh, you know, bu bugs will happen. Please report them. Uh, as of 12.0, I will try to help you if uh, if you run PF in a jail and it panics for you. If you do it in 11, I will just point and laugh. Unless you threaten to pay me, in which case I will, I will quietly laugh and help you. Anyway, I've been talking about this uh, forever now. Um, and how do we actually run a, a VNet jail with its own IP stack? I, I bet it's really, really hard. No, that, that's it. So we, we start the jail, we give it a name. Alcatraz in this case, because, you know, I think that's hilarious. Uh, we tell it that we want it to be a VNet jail, and we want to persist it. And persist just tells the jail that, you know, the jails should keep existing even if there are no processes in it. And usually that's a silly thing to want, because jails isolate processes, and if you don't have a process, 
why would you bother to isolate it? But in this case, the jail has an IP stack, and you could forward packets. So, so that's it. Uh, so we're, we're done here, right? Well, to be entirely fair, that's not all that there's to it. We also need some, you know, some network interfaces. It's a lot easier to test network things when you can communicate with the outside world. So to do that, we've got something called ePair. Uh, ePair is actually really simple. It's uh, two network interfaces with a cable between them, except the cable doesn't exist and the network interfaces are virtual, but it's two network interfaces with a cable. So we get an ePair uh, 0, uh, which has an A and a B side, and A and B are linked with each other, and if you stick a packet into A, it will come out of B and the other way around. The usual way you would use them is you would give an IP address to the A interface, you would stick the B interface in the jail, so you know, same thing, we start the jail with VNAT, and oh, by the way, you have an interface called ePair 0B, and then we can actually execute a command inside the jail, and I still haven't fixed my slides, this mix misses Alcatraz, so <laughs> execute inside Alcatraz, I have config ePair 0B, there's an IP address, and then you can ping it, and that's, that's all there's to it. And we're already testing our IP stack. We're testing that we can send ICMP echo requests and get replies. It's not terribly exciting, but it actually runs a whole lot of code. And we, we had you know, any number of panics around this because it turns out that setting up and shutting down an IP stack or, or a network stack is something that we only ever did when we booted and when we rebooted. And if you do you know, 20 of those, rather than one, and you do several of them, one after the other, or you do them at the same time, you run into bugs that you never ever run into in other situations. But that's basically all we need to do. Uh, so, so let's take a look at writing a test for this. Uh, that's not all that there's to the test, but you know, the, the entire test case doesn't fit on my slides. Uh, so what do we do? We use the automated testing framework, which again, you know, we totally invented ourselves and in no way stole from uh, NetBSD. Uh, include some utilities, declare a test case, you know, we have a v4 test case. Cleanup just says that there is a cleanup function and you should call it after you're done with the tests. Test head just describes the test, so we set the description. Basic pass block test for IPv4. We require a user. Uh, for some reason, people think that security is important, and maybe we shouldn't allow people to spin up new IP stacks and network configuration unless they're actually, you know, root. The only thing this does is make sure that when you run the tests as not root, this test will just skip, because it, it can't possibly succeed. The interesting bits is the test body, and that's, that's all there is to it. Uh, Although, admittedly, I've stripped out a bunch of tests, but this is a functional test. This is useful. So we have general initialization codes. Uh, the initialization code doesn't do a whole lot of exciting work. It just goes and checks that the v, uh, VNet feature is available in your kernel, because if it's not, there's no point in running this test. It also checks that PF is available, because you know, testing PF when the PF module is not loaded, again, not terribly useful. We create an ePair. We assign an IP address to it, just like we discussed earlier. Create a jail, helper script to create a jail, create jail Alcatraz, give it uh, an interface, set an IP address in the jail, and then just, you know, basic sanity check. So ATF check will just go and verify that the next command will return exit status zero. We ignore <laughs> standard out because we don't care what it says as long as it returns with zero. One ping only with a timeout of one second to that IP address. Hopefully, you know, the jail will reply and everything will be well. Oh. Next step, we enable PF. PF by default passes everything, so this should still work. So, you know, check, exit status zero, and then we're going to block everything. So we set rules in the jail, block input. This is a simple helper function. It just makes life easier when you can write this rather than, you know, write it to a text file or, or echo it and pipe it into the jail. Uh, into the jail. It's much shorter to write this. Yeah. Remember, I'm lazy. Um, so we check that we get an error output. We still don't care about standard outs and that this, that this thing will fail. 
fun thing about this, as we'll see later when I show some output, is this entire test run takes 1.2 seconds. The entire second is taken up by this because we spend a second waiting for a reply that will never ever come. I mean, it shouldn't, unless we totally broke in something. Everything else is 200 milliseconds to top start the jail. So, you know, maybe we should do some boot time improvement so we can get things to boot faster in Beehive, but we're, I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where we can boot an entire machine in 200 milliseconds. Well, actually boot it, do some work in it, and shut it down in 200 milliseconds. But we can do that with VNet jails, which makes it a lot easier to run a lot of these tests. I say a lot, we have some tests for uh, PF right now, not that many, but enough that they catch bugs, and they only tend to take about a minute. So cleanup, pretty easy. Uti there's a utility function. The other utility functions, whenever they create an interface or a jail, helpfully keep track of this in a temporary file, so the cleanup function just goes and looks what's in the temporary file. Oh, we've created the ePair 0A, delete ePair 0A. We've created the ePair 1A, delete 1A. Uh, we've created the, the Alcatraz jail, okay, remove the Alcatraz jail. Just so that we clean up everything so that the next test isn't going to conflict with whatever we've left behind. And then this is just ATF infrastructure. If you're really, really interested in how all of the ATF things work, uh, there's an article in the FreeBSD journal about this. Uh, so you can take a look at that. The FreeBSD journal is now free, so you can just get onto the FreeBSD Foundation website and go take a look at it. What does this output? Well, there we go. We do, you know, sudo because we need to be root to run this, obviously. Keyword test, pass walk v4. Pass block v4, the test passes, hooray, it works, 1.2 seconds. We even have some results, we can go and look at you know, what sort of output did this test generate, uh, which is useful, uh, although to be entirely fair, usually when the tests fail, I will start off by adding set-x to the test body so that I can see what commands it's all executing. Uh, and we'll probably end up setting a sleep 3600 somewhere so that it doesn't clean up the jail so I can go look at, you know, we have the test set up and now I can send some pings and I can TCP dump and I can, I might even detrace or, or look at some other statistics, uh, some other counters to, you know, what is actually going on here. Um, but they run, and these things run automatically, these things run several times a day, so the next time somebody breaks PF so that it, you know, rather than dropping packets, just lets them all through, which, you know, how would you notice unless you test? Uh, and it is kind of important for your firewall to occasionally drop packets, and maybe even the right packets. Anyway, um, next example is a much, much more complicated example, um, because it's, it, it's a test for PFSync. Uh, for those of you who don't know, PF has this wonderful feature where you can synchronize states between uh, two machines. So uh, I, the, the typical use case for this is when you have uh, a gateway machine, you just have a second one. And if one of them dies or you take it down for an upgrade, the other one will take over. But you want it to remember states because if your TCP session is running, you would like it to keep running. So PFSync will send state from one machine to the other so that it can notionally take over. Some very basic tests for this. We create a couple of interfaces uh, because you know we'll have two well, machines, we'll have two jails. Jail one, jail two. We'll have interfaces to all of those jails and we'll have a link between them so that they can exchange state. Hence the e pair sync, e pair one, e pair two. Jail one, jail two. I got tired of the naming my jails after <coughs> this jails joke here as you can tell. Uh, give them the two interfaces, configure interfaces in jail one, enable PF sync, synchronize over sync A device, send some up, uh, max update. If I remember correctly, that just tells PF sync that the moment you have a single update ready, send it out, because usually it tries to uh, gather up a whole bunch of updates before it starts to send packets off to the other side. Set it up, do the same thing with the second jail. So 
there's a lot going on there, but it's basically all related to how do I actually configure PF Sync uh, to do something. Enable PF in both of the jails, uh, set IP addresses, and then we send a ping. This ping will travel through the first jail, and after some time, that state will get synchronized to the other jail, so we can go ask jail 2, you know, what states do you have? And do you have an ICMP state for this particular IP address? You should have one because we sent an ICMP echo through it. We go look for it, make sure that it matches what we expect it to do, and if we don't find it, the test fails. So it's a very primitive, well, it's a very basic test. It's set up PF sync, make sure that the one state we deliberately create in it ends up in the on the other side. It's primitive, but it tests a lot of the functionality of pfsync. It's basic, you know, the basic functionality of pfsync has to work for this test to work. I did some work on pfsync recently, and you know, this test failed very often. Um, it also demonstrates that you know, it is actually not that hard to test something that needs two machines. You can test things with even more machines. I have tested for things like uh, fragment handling as well. I don't have examples in the slides, but there's one where you know, we send a bunch of fragments at it and we test what happens. So these are all fa fairly simple tests because we send you know, correctly formatted uh, packets. There are some tests that do things like uh, use KP, the Python tool, to build arbitrary packets to send malformed packets, which is another fun thing to do to your uh, network stack. Uh, um, I, yeah, I'm, Trying to remember, I think for some of the recent security issues, I also wrote something to send specifically malformed packets to trigger something that would otherwise have been a panic, but now is no longer a panic because Alexander fixed the bug for us. Or remember, Sasha. Sasha was, it, was it you or Sasha? Sasha fixed it. Okay. So I've set the credit to the wrong side then. Anyway. For those of you interested in our tests, the PF tests live under user source, assuming that's where you've installed your source. Tests, sys, netpfil, pf, to mirror where our PF code lives, uh, our PF code lives user source, sys, netpfil, pf. When they get installed, they're in user tests, sys, netpfil, pf. If you want to run them, sudo package install qa, and then go to, uh, well, actually, there we go. Install QA, install SCAPE because that tests a few more things. KLD loads PF sync, which will implicitly load PF. Go to user tests, sys, uh, net pfil, and then probably sudo uh, QA test unless you've done all of this as root already. Uh, there's a lot more information in the journal. Well, there's information on how to write uh, ATF tests. Uh, you should all be writing tests. Yes, even you OpenBSD people, you should be writing tests for FreeBSD. <laughs> Just copy that. Uh, well, there is actually a lot to be said for we should we should take a look at some of your tests. Are you threatening to pay us to do it? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm threatening you with my eternal gratitude. Uh, so there's, a, there's an article in the uh, FreeBSD journal, uh, the March-April edition of this year, uh, on you know, how do you write some test things. Uh, hopefully one of our documentation people will actually go and add some of this to the handbook as well. Benedict's working on it. Benedict's not here, but I'm going to apply social pressure anyway. Um, important things, uh, well, if I still haven't convinced you now uh, what we need is, is some sort of deeply profound quote by someone famous. I didn't have the budget for that, so you get me quote telling you, you know, write tests. Tests are good. I don't know about how profound that is, but it is actually true. Tests are wonderful. What's in that for you? You can prototype some of your setups. Uh, because sometimes you try to do things and they don't actually work. <coughs> you can prototype a lot of networking setups with just jails, which means that you can do it in a virtual machine on a plane over, over whatever ocean you like to fly over. It also means that if you write a test for this and you, you, know, you give us the test case, we'll include it and we'll run it, which means that your use case is not going to break, or when it breaks, we're going to know. And we're going to know pretty much immediately after we commit the breaking change, 
rather than three years later when you finally get around to upgrading and then notice that your careful use case no longer works. And we broke it three years ago. Uh, developers have, uh, well, I might be projecting here, it might just be me, but in general developers have a very short attention span. So if you notice that they broke something a couple of days after they did it, you're a lot more likely to get them to care than when you notice three years later. Uh, what else is in it for you? Right, yes, as I, as I mentioned before, write a test case because it makes it really, it makes it much easier for me to fix your bug. I'm lazy, make it easy for me. Uh, reproducing t uh, bugs is, is hard. I need to understand your entire test setup. And I often get, you know, well, I get two types of bug reports, usually. I get the one that says, it's broken, please fix it, with no information in it as to, you know, what is broken, what is your test setup, how do you break it, how often does it break, in what way does it break. No information whatsoever. The other type, and that is somewhat more rare, is here's 200,000 lines of output about my environment. IP addresses, firewalls. Uh, net stat output, state output, and I need three hours to run through all of that and work out what your setup actually is. If you write a minimal test case, it will take me 30 seconds to work that out. Also, if you want to get a patch into uh, our code, if you've written a use case for it, uh, sorry, if you've written a test case for it, it means that I will understand what your use case is for that patch. It also tells me that, you know, you've actually tested this patch and I'm going to have to write a test for this anyway. I'm, I'm trying very hard lately to, every time I make a change, to actually have a corresponding test. I don't always succeed, but often enough that we're getting more and more tests for PF. So I'm going to have to write that test anyway, unless you do it for me, of course. If all of that seems a lot like, you know, work, you can also just pay me and then I will happily do whatever for you. Um, I would like to encourage you all to write tests. You wouldn't be the first to do this. Olivier has already written some tests for IPsec. Uh, Olivier was tired of IPsec being broken with certain algorithms. So he wrote a test and now IPsec is not broken. Um, and if it does break, uh, Li Wen here will shout at them. Well, actually, that's a lie. Li Wen will politely ask them to fix it, which is very nearly just as good. Um, also, uh, somebody's working on a Google Summer of Code project right now, and I'm totally blanking on their name, uh, to write more tests. Uh, so the objective of that project is to write firewall tests in such a way that we can use them for all three of our firewalls. <coughs> Because right now, PF is the only firewall with tests. So, you know, if you need to choose a firewall, choose IPFW because it's great and it doesn't need tests. Yeah. Or, or possibly... <laughs> or possibly choose PF and, and send me tests. Or send me test cases, rather. Um, I think I've covered pretty much everything, so do you have questions? Do you have heckles? Do you have bags of money to throw at me? <laughs> yes, bags of money. No, question. Ah, oh well. Uh, also good. Because I was thinking more about testing the user on it. Like, I don't trust changes that people want to make to my PFI on a current day account. So I wanted to see if I could test to make sure that the firewall, my firewall is blocking what I think it's blocking. Could we reuse the ATF test to do that? Or are there other frameworks out there that we can use for more of a user on Right, so the question is about user land testing for, uh, well, for existing rule sets. So I think there's two aspects to this. Uh, one of the, t the tests I did not talk about is also a product of the uh, 2017 Google Summer of Code project. Uh, the student wrote some tests to test the PFCouple parser. There's quite a lot of code in user space that parses rules. And we have had some regressions in there where we accidentally broke previously accepted syntax. So there are some tests there that take, you know, some rules, parse them, and have the FCouple spit them back out, and then we compare to see, you know, did it actually read what we expect? 
So that's one part of it, but that's straight syntax checking. That's not functionality checking. If you're interested in, you know, we have a rule set and we want to know, does it actually do what we expect it to do? You could write very similar tests to these. You would want to start some jails, probably one or, well, probably between two and three, or between one and two, uh, depending on how you do it. You'd want a jail that pretends to be your firewall. You want to put some interfaces in it, and you could rename your interfaces so you can literally reuse your rule set, or you can just define aliases and then fill them out differently. Uh, and then you can inject traffic and watch at the other end of the interfaces to see what traffic goes through and what traffic does not go through. Um, the test cases I write, I typically try to restrict very much to testing one aspect of the functionality at a time both because that makes for shorter and easier tests and it makes for shorter and easier debugging sessions. Uh, but you could certainly imagine uh, writing a test like this with, you know, I, I don't know how many interfaces your firewall has, but let's say five different interfaces with a bunch of different networks and some VLANs attached to it. You should be able to replicate that basically entirely as a VNet jail and then send traffic at it and see what happens should be entirely possible to do. Any other questions? Yes? Um, so you might agree that our multicast code could use some tests. Um, and I've thought a lot about using, using this framework, but part of the problem is that I, I really want to write C code for these tests because they, they are mostly driven through socket options. Um, <coughs> do you have any plan or know of any, any work being done to write like, two library equivalents for the, for the JSEC uh, or, like, or for the JL commands that you use? Uh, so the question is, uh, we would like some tests for this for multicast, and because multicast has to <coughs> involves to a large extent uh, socket options that need to be set, uh, Mark would like some um, some C codes to do this in. Um, yes and no, you can write ATF tests in C, but I don't know if that's what you actually want to do, because I think you'll want to write some shell code to build a test setup because your multicast tests might involve multiple hosts, depending on which side of uh, things that you're testing. You probably, you know, uh, thinking about this live, uh, you might want to see it as two different sets of tests. You have the tests for the uh, syscall layer interface, so of between user space and the kernel, and those you probably just want to write with ATFC, and then you can set socket options and you can test all sorts of things. Um, where maybe you want to run your test program inside the VNet jail. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question, we should talk about that. The second part of what you might want to do is the, uh, the network side of multicast. You know, when we send uh, IGMP join and leave messages. And for that you probably want to do the shell thing where you set up a, a VNet jail and you you trigger it to do things uh, either with, with some test programs, possibly even from Python, because you can do some um, set sock opt from Python just as well as you can from C. Or, you know, whatever other scripting language takes your fancy. I, I understand that not everybody is a huge Python fan. Uh, so you could do things like that. Combining them gets slightly tricky, but I'm sure that it's possible. Uh, to get on a different course there is uh, a lot of our tools really want to be split up into a binary and a library. So if we would tear up the jail command and the jexec command in a, a very thin binary wrapper around the library, that would make that problem a lot easier as well. Uh, but I'm going to assign that work to someone else. Any other questions? Yeah, so the question is, can I take multiple of these jails and plug them together to simulate a network? And the answer is yes. You can simulate arbitrarily complex networks with arbitrary number of routers in between. 
So what you would do is you would create you know, jail 1, jail 2, jail 3. You would create a bunch of ePair interfaces and then you would use uh, an ePair interface to create a link from jail A to jail B and from jail A to jail C and from jail B to jail C and from jail C to A and B. Any topology you like, you can create them in there. You can set routing options or uh, routes inside that jail. Because perhaps one example uh, or one, one advantage of this that I didn't really go into that much is, uh, well, is, is this. It is trivial to execute commands inside the jail. You just go jexec jail name, do the command. So you can go jexec Alcatraz uh, route add default whatever. You can set whatever route you like in those jails. You can set whatever IP address you like. They don't need network connectivity because you not, you're not interacting with them over the network. You're just giving them orders from the outside, which makes it really, really easy to build setups like that. So the answer, you know, to make a very long answer short, yes, absolutely, you can do that. Anyone else? Any heckling? We've gone through the questions. No heckling? When are you updating PF? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If you want us to write tests for you, why don't you update PF and then we'll really want to write tests for you. Uh, so, so the OpenBSD people's heckling <laughs> is why don't you update PF? And the reply to that is I, I would like to, but my users will kill me when I drop performance by 80%. Actually, 80% is slightly exaggerated. Uh, so I, I did some work on, on PF Sync performance, and because our PF Sync used to contend on a single mutex, which is roughly the situation that OpenBSD is in right now, I saw no more than well, no more. I saw 1.4 million packets a second through that. Without PF Sync, so our PF, it's closer to 3.8, 3.9 million packets a second. Uh, there's still some work to be done. There's a very vague plan for, you know, if, if ever I have the time and motivation uh, it, to uh, see what we can do about importing OpenBSD's PF and uh, helping them or, or, or us working, collaborating, I think is the better way to describe it, uh, to, to change the locking um, so that it will scale. Uh, OpenBSD is working on this and I'm sure they'll get there. Uh, but I'm also sure that it's a hard problem and it's not something they're going to do in the next two weeks. No. So with that heckle return... I thought, I thought you, were, you were telling me just this morning you were going to commit the lockless system calls tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, Theo's hiking for two weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> that, what could go wrong? <laughs> you won't get in trouble for at least two weeks. But we don't have a test, so... We're <laughs> uh, so, so it is. It is about lunchtime. So, so you have a choice now. I can, I can rant on about one more example of a test, or I can all, uh, or I can let you all go to find. Oh, sorry. Uh, one more remark. Question. Peggle. Uh, echo remark. I was just going to say, as a networker, please, for the love of God, nobody get the right idea to run these against production. Oh, well, yes. Because you will break shit horribly and it will be bad. Yes, so, so the missing disclaimer here, and that is, that is a legitimate point, is don't run these tests on your production machine. I mean, maybe run them before you take it into production, but, but don't run them on your production machine. Certainly don't run them when your sysadmin can get at you, because your sysadmin will get at you and you will have a bad day. Uh, I, I've tried to take care to uh, to use network uh, subnets that will not conflict with anything existing, but don't don't do that on a production system. Do it on a development system. Well, actually, after example of the question, though, on a production system, you want to know is my system still valid? So In that why question, not run tests like this like once a week, once a month, uh, from two to three a.m. Whatever works. Your particular situation. You, because it is most fun to page the guy running your switches between 2 and 3 a.m. <laughs> that's the best time to run these because that's when they like to get woken up when shit falls over. That's not good on my network because I study crops. You know? I'll punch you. I'm good at it. That's you're on my network. You know, whatever that you were careful to avoid IP context. Like if you know the jail 
is are they separate play spaces out there? They're like hard games where you can actually they, they are separate IP spaces, yeah. but for my tests I tend to uh, use the host uh, to inject packets from. So the host will have a route to some of these subnets. So if they conflict, uh, if I happen to use a subnet that you're using in your network, you shouldn't be because they're they're test subnets, but but if you're using them, then yes, it will break your routing. The, the typical use case for these tests is very much you're developing and you're doing this during development. Can I give you a hand? Sure. Look up the NSA's AS. They have a big blob of addresses. Just use those. You'll never conflict. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's been the right Don't use RSE 1918. Everybody uses those. To use the NSA subnets because they have a big subnet range and, and you know it's not public on the internet. But I make it a policy to not pick fights with people who have an answer for you and what army. <laughs> so, Bjorn? <laughs> there are official YAML and Dynamics and Rainbow metrics that can use Yes. Um, how easy is it to convert legacy tests that people had, like shell scripts and everything, into the framework? I've, so the question is how easy is it to convert legacy tests that people have into this framework? And the answer is that I don't know because I've never tried. I wouldn't think that it's terribly hard. I think that depending on how those tests are built, you get to throw away a lot of your code uh, and just uh, just you know start the jail, set some configuration in it, set, uh, send some traffic. Uh, I, I honestly don't have a better answer than that. Uh, send me a pointer and I will add that to my ever growing to do list. Cool. I'll give you five pointers as well. Yes. Uh, one comment to the addresses and networks. In the OpenBSD tests, I can pass the, the network settings via the environment to the, to the test. So everyone can set up his own network environment. And the reaction of other people using my test was give me your IP addresses, otherwise, it's too complicated. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. I've chosen not to do that to keep, uh, to keep the test easy. Uh, I like that, uh, well, let's, let's wander into the next example here. Um, I like that it is extremely easy to read these tests because everything you need to know is here. So when we do things like set firewall rules, you can just read the firewall rule and see everything that's involved in it. Uh, if you, you know, what IP address are we setting, we can just see what IP address we're setting. You can certainly make a case that that should be abstracted and it should be a variable, and it's really easy to do because it's just a shell script, so we can have some common variables that define IP addresses and subnets <coughs> we're going to use and use those. But it's an extra layer of abstraction and it makes it harder to follow what's actually going on. Uh, so a lot of these tests take me 10, 15 minutes to write and then you know half an hour to get them robust and cleaned up. But they are remarkably easy to write and I think in part that is because there is what I feel is the right level of abstraction. Uh, you know, these, these, I don't want to advocate for, uh, for a policy of, oh, it's only test code, none of the rules apply. But it is only test code, and there is a limit to the amount of abstraction that you need. OK, if that's it, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for, for the limited heckling I got. And enjoy lunch.